All righty, gang, welcome to our distance lecture or video lecture or whatever. Uh, and so let me just jump right into it since, since I know there are no questions on anything. Uh, okay, this chapter deals with intelligence. Uh, so that's the next topic that we're doing. Uh, and the first thing that we always have to do is we have to try to define what it is we're talking about. Intelligence is one of those things that researchers have been arguing about the definition of intelligence for centuries, and that's a literal truth. Uh, ever since you know, the first folks tried to figure out what intelligence was, uh, arguments commenced uh, about how it should be defined. And even today, uh, we don't have a single agreed upon definition of what exactly intelligence is. However, uh, there are some features uh, and some general ideas uh, that most researchers tend to agree on. And so that's what you're looking at here. Uh, so first important point. Uh, we don't have a precise definition of intelligence, okay? There's disagreements about that. Uh, and that led to a, a well-known historian uh, of psychology, a guy named Edward Boring. Um, he became so frustrated with this whole area uh, that he, he, a very famous uh, sort of quip of his about intelligence was that intelligence is just whatever an intelligence test measures. Um, that simply is to reflect the frustration uh, that many psychologists felt about trying to define what intelligence is. Okay, so no agreed upon definition of intelligence. There's a lot of frustration about exactly what we mean by intelligence, but there are some general ideas that most psychologists uh, agree upon or at least uh, they're, they're tolerant of when we're talking about intelligence so that we have some idea of what is this concept we're talking about. And there you see them, okay? Most folks, when they talk about intelligence, uh, most experts on the topic, uh, will think of intelligence as some kind of global capacity to think rationally, uh, to act purposefully, to deal effectively with the environment. Uh, we tend to think that more intelligent people uh, are more adept, more able, uh, to function effectively in their environment than less intelligent people. Uh, of course, what that means is that whatever your environment demands, you're able to somehow fit in with it well. Doesn't necessarily mean you're an intellectual egghead. Uh, it could be that you're just very wise when it comes to street smarts and being able to get along with others and that kind of stuff, but still, that represents a particular kind of intelligence. Okay? Um, others uh, who want to add something more to this talk about intelligence also requiring such things as higher mental processes, uh, being able to reason effectively, uh, having a good uh, ability to understand concepts and ideas, uh, being able to make good judgments. Um, they think this also should be included. Not everybody agrees with that, but uh, others, uh, you know, a good number of researchers would argue, yes, intelligence is you know, thinking rationally, acting purposefully, dealing effectively with your environment, but also higher mental processes need to be included in this as well. Reasoning, understanding, judgment, logical thinking. And others then would also include abstract thinking, being able to understand abstract concepts and uh, ideas that aren't necessarily concretely represented in the environment. Okay, so these are some of the ideas uh, that uh, experts uh, talk about uh, when they talk about intelligence and, and what they mean by intelligence. Let's talk about the whole history of trying to measure intelligence, uh, trying to put some kind of a, a number to it, uh, trying to assess individuals and say, these people are more intelligent than those people, or these people are able to do something with their minds better than other people. Okay. This starts back in the mid-1800s. So when I said we've been arguing about this for centuries, I wasn't lying. Uh, Francis Galton, uh, one of the first individuals who's most well known for trying to measure and understand and define what intelligence is, uh, he argued that one of the critical aspects of intelligence is sensory capacity. Uh, so what intelligent people are able to do that less intelligent people have difficulty with uh, is to be able to detect sensory signals, process those signals, and interpret those signals. Okay? Uh, and so his approach to intelligence was to try to measure sensory capacity in some, some fashion. Uh, so he would be measuring uh, how much information you could gather from a visual pattern, uh, how much information you could gather from uh, words or paragraphs that are read to you. Uh, so your different senses, your vision, your touch, your hearing, uh, how able are they to detect signals out in the environment, interpret those signals, and make sense out of them. 
he would argue that was a, a critical aspect or a critical contributor to your intelligence. However, uh, when he tried to start to test this idea, not all of it worked out very well. Okay? And so as you can see, uh, one of the first findings that cast some doubt on this uh, was the fact that when we start measuring different sensory capacities, very often they weren't necessarily related to each other. So somebody could be very, very quick with their eyes, uh, detect visual patterns and interpret those patterns very, very quickly, uh, but not be so good in terms of being able to understand with their ears or being able to process a lot of auditory signals. Um, and so what does that mean regarding their intelligence? Well, if you think that detecting visual patterns is critical for intelligence, you're going to say they're really, really smart. Uh, however, if you say, no, it's you know, being able to process things auditorily that's much more important for your intelligence, well, then you're going to say they're not real smart. Uh, and so this led to some contradictions because what, what Dalton re Galton really meant uh, when he talked about sensory capacity was global sensory capacity. You know, you're all of your senses. So for an intelligent person, all of your senses should be really good uh, and be able to take in a lot of information and process that information. That didn't, true, didn't prove necessarily to be true. Also, after, now this comes after Galton, uh, when we actually started to come up with IQ tests and that kind of stuff, um, a lot of folks started trying to correlate different sensory ability with intelligence tests and they didn't find that those things were highly correlated. So just because you had really sensitive eyes or you really could uh, process visual patterns well, that didn't necessarily mean that you're gonna do well on an IQ test. So that was Galton's first attempt at it. Uh, and we're not saying that he was entirely wrong because as you'll see later on, this idea is still out there and there still are ways of testing this, but at least it didn't work out real well to begin with, okay? Okay, uh, when we talk about the IQ test, uh, or we talk about having some kind of a paper and pencil test uh, that you could uh, sit somebody down in a classroom and you could have them uh, fill out this thing and then we would somehow measure your intelligence from that, the history of that really starts with these guys. Uh, and this goes back to uh, the early 1900s uh, with Alfred Binet. Uh, and also Lewis Terman that we'll talk about. But this really is the beginning of intelligence testing in the way that we think about intelligence testing, which is having some kind of an IQ test, a paper and pencil test uh, that people sit down at a desk, uh, they sit down there and they write out answers, and then we score that somehow. Okay, how did all this get started? Uh, 1905, one of the things that happened in uh, France uh, is uh, a law that mandated compulsory education. Uh, so everybody had to go to school. Uh, this wasn't necessarily the case prior to this. So what did that mean? Uh, that meant that uh, you're going to have all these folks coming in from the French hinterlands uh, attending public schools uh, that hadn't necessarily been doing this before. And the French government looked at this as um, a potential disaster uh, because you're going to have all these folks coming in, uh, kids of different ages, how much you know, uh, academic training they've had, how much background they've had, have they just been out in the fields working, have, uh, are they literate? You know, we are, you were gonna have kids coming into schools that were at all kinds of different levels of academic achievement. Uh, what were you gonna do with them? Could you stick them all into first grade, just depending upon their age? Well, French government didn't wanna do that. Instead, uh, what they wanted to do is they wanted to come up with some kind of an assessment test. Uh, an entrance exam, you might say. Uh, a test that they could give all these kids who are going to be newly coming into the French public school system. Uh, somehow this test would rank them, it would rate them on their academic level, on their intellectual level, uh, and they could use that then to determine where they would put them in the French public school system. Were they a little bit uh, above average? Were they below average? Did they need some remedial ed? What do we do with these kids? They tasked Alfred Binet with coming up with this entrance exam, you might say, this test that would tell the school administrators, where was this kid at? Uh, what grade should we assign them to? Do they need remedial work? And so Binet and a lot of his, he then hired all kinds of research assistants. Uh, in fact, one of his research assistants was Jean Piaget, who became a very famous um, developmental psychologist in his own right. Uh, but in any case, they went out, him and his team, uh, and they created uh, a test uh, that could be used then to measure kids that were coming into the French school system. 
and the test was reasonably successful. Um, the test did two things. When they were done with all of this uh, and they started using the test and they had some uh, data on it and they, they were working with it for a couple of years, uh, they noticed two things that the test was really doing a fairly decent job of. First thing it was doing, it was doing a decent job of giving them uh, an immediate here and now assessment of the intellectual level of the kid. So you bring the kid in, you give him Binet's test, you get a number on that test, and that number tells you, okay, where do we put them? Okay, first grade, second grade, remedial ed, where do they belong? What's their uh, intellectual standing right at this moment so that we can put them in the right place that's going to be best for them? Uh, so that was one thing. Second thing that they noticed about the test was that uh, it was predictive. In other words, if you brought the kid in, you gave them the test today, they got a score on it, you put them somewhere, wherever they belonged, and then you waited, you followed the kid over the course of many years. Um, the score that they got initially on that test, that could be used to predict their, their later academic success. So in other words, a kid that came in that got a very high score, um, if we followed that kid over the years, they were more likely to get good grades, graduate, go on to university potentially. Uh, you bring some kid in and right there and then they get a rather low score. Uh, if we follow that kid over many, many years, one of the things we find is they probably don't have as good of grades. Uh, they may just graduate from high school. They may not go on to university. Uh, and so their academic success tended to be less. And so the initial score not only told them where to put the kid, the initial score also had some predictive value. It could also give them an indicator of how likely it was they were going to be academically successful later on through their entire school career. Okay. That's an important, the predictive value of these tests is an important thing that's going to come back again and again. Okay, so that was Binet's test. And as far as its usefulness in the public, French public school system, it pretty much did what the French government wanted. Louis Terman uh, is an American, uh, and he's at Stanford University around this time. He gets wind of Binet's test. Uh, and he brings it over to the United States. And he translates it into English. He takes all of the French cultural kind of stuff, uh, things that are unique to, to France and French culture that, that French students would have understood. He takes all that out and he Americanizes it. And he makes it amenable, suitable for students uh, in the United States to use. Um, and so he's now taken the Binet test and he's translated it into an Americanized, American IQ test or intelligence test uh, that can be used in academic settings in the United States. Um, what Terman did way back in the early 1900s uh, has continued on. Uh, there's a legacy from this. Uh, and the test that he originally created uh, that over the years has been updated, modified, uh, it continues to be used today. Uh, it's referred to as the Stanford Binet test of intelligence. So it's Binet's original test. Uh, Terman was at Stanford University, uh, and it, it's one of the more popular IQ tests that's still around today. Uh, but this is this now then is the bringing of Binet's test and the bringing of IQ testing over to the United States. Okay, that's one of the important things uh, of one of the important contributions of term in here. And also to recognize that that test is still with us uh, and referred to as the Stanford Binet IQ test or test of intelligence. Okay, our next important player here is uh, in the uh, mid 1900s, 1939, uh, David Weschler. And uh, David Weschler looked at the, I, the intelligence tests that were being used, the Stanford Binet test that was out there, other sorts of measures that were around. Uh, and in his view, there were some inadequacies uh, that he believed he could address with another version of an intelligence test. Okay, um, Two important things that um, Weschler is going to do with his attempt to create an even better uh, intelligence test. One, he wants to broaden the test. Okay? Uh, he believes that intelligence, as it's being measured at this time, is too narrow. Uh, mostly, as he looks at the Stanford Binet test and some of the other measures that were around at the time, mostly, in his view, what those tests were measuring is something that he called verbal intelligence. How well do you use language? Um, 
Uh, how well do you understand definitions and concepts? Um, how analytical is your thinking? How reductionistic is your thinking? All of that, he said, depended very much on verbal ability and language ability. He wanted to add another whole component to intelligence testing, another kind of intelligence that he felt wasn't being captured on tests that were current at the time. He referred to this as performance IQ. Okay? Um, as you'll see in a little bit when we go into more detail on his test, this has much more to do with things like pattern recognition, um, intuition, uh, being able to look at something and derive meaning out of it, something that's not necessarily verbal, but you know, a picture, uh, or being able to take uh, different um, patterns and put them together into some kind of a logical order, uh, this sort of thing. An, a type of intelligence that doesn't depend on verbal ability. Okay? Um, so he wants to add that to the test along with the verbal stuff. So that means that his test is going to get a lot more complicated in a sense. It's going to have a lot more aspects to it than what the Stanford Binet test had at that time. He, at his time, uh, composes an intelligence test that has 11 subscales. Um, and about half of these scales, about four or five of them, are measuring verbal intelligence. Uh, and then whatever's left there, six or seven, uh, are measuring this performance IQ. So he's broadened the test out. It, it's, it has more aspects to it. It's testing more types of intelligence, he thinks, not just verbal intelligence. So that's one way that he broadens it. He broadens what we mean by intelligence and broadens our, hopefully, our ability to measure those things or our attempts to measure those things. Second way that he broadens it out is making it more amenable to more types of subjects. So most of the IQ tests that were around at this time were primarily targeted at school-age children. That's what Binet was doing originally, and uh, when Terman took Binet's test, he pretty much kept it you know, more or less uh, as, as targeted at the same subject population. Um, okay, Weschler said that's fine, uh, but there's more people out there than just school-age children. Uh, and so we need to devise some kind of intelligence measures that allow us to tap into these other populations. So along with adding more subscales to it, uh, now we have actual different versions of the test. Um, most of you, uh, if you're going to take an intelligence test, uh, are probably going to take what's called the WACE. Okay? Uh, WACE stands for Weschler Adult Intelligence Scale. Uh, and that's the IQ test or the intelligence test that's uh, targeted at adults or young adults. Uh, if you're a school-aged kid, uh, you're going to take the WISC, uh, which is another form of the test, uh, which has been modified so that it's more uh, applicable, more useful for uh, younger-aged kids, school-aged kids. Uh, and so that's the WISC, uh, which is Weschler's Intelligence Scale for Children. Okay? Uh, and then finally, the WIPSI, uh, which is an intelligence test which is for preschool kids, kids that don't have a lot of verbal ability yet. Uh, so we want to measure their intelligence, but obviously we can't use a lot of um, you know, multiple choice questions and the kind of things that really make a lot of demands on language because preschool kids aren't all that linguistic yet, so we have to find other kinds of ways of trying to measure their intelligence. That's what the WIPSI does. Uh, Weschler's Preschool Primary Scale of Intelligence, what WIPSI stands for. Okay? So there you have David Weschler. Uh, and the important thing to understand about Weschler is he's trying to broaden out what we mean by intelligence, how we're testing intelligence, and then also broaden out the different subject populations that we can give an intelligence test to. Okay? Probably today, if most people take an intelligence test, they're going to be taking one of Weschler's scales. His is probably the most popular uh, intelligence test out there today. Stanford Binet is probably in second place, although it's, it's used a fair amount, but mostly Stanford Binet is still mostly used with uh, school age kids, uh, whereas the, uh, Weiss, or excuse me, the Weschler scales can be used with a, a broader population. Okay, World War I comes around. Uh, and when World War I comes around and the United States uh, gets involved in World War I, something kind of similar happens as what happened in France when you had compulsory education and all these folks started coming into the public school system. Well, all these folks, uh, in this case uh, recruits, uh, are coming into the army um, in order for the war effort. 
Uh, and once again, the army is interested in having some kind of an assessment of what's the intellectual standing of these guys. Okay? So again, World War I, you're talking 1916, 1917, whenever the United States got involved in it. Uh, and if you think about the United States at that time, much more rural, uh, many, many more people living out in the countryside. Uh, to what extent uh, they had access to education is questionable. How, what proportion of them was even literate uh, at this time uh, was what's much more questionable. So if you think about the early 1900s, a much, much higher proportion of the population, especially the rural population, was illiterate. Um, and so all of these guys now uh, are being drafted into the army to fight in World War I, and the army is concerned about that. Uh, obviously, they don't want to throw an army you know, manual, combat manual, at some guy who can't read. <laughs> okay? That's not going to do him any good, not going to do the, that guy any good, not going to do the army any good. So they need to come up with some kind of an assessment measure that at least gives them a rough idea of the intellectual standing of the individual, of the recruits as they're coming into the army. Now, they can't expend the time and energy and effort to give everybody a Weschler scale. Weschler scales, as I'll talk more about later, it's going to take uh, you know, a half a day, hours, uh, and it's an individual administration. This is not something you can give on a group-wide basis in a very efficient way. It's a very individualized, extended kind of testing situation. Whoops, sorry. Uh, they need to come up with what we tend to refer to now as a quick and dirty assessment. Uh, you can bring in a hundred people into a room, pass out something uh, on a piece of paper. It takes, you know, at the most a half an hour. Uh, they fill in little dots or they fill in, you know, squares or something. You give it back, you, you score it, you've got a measure of their intelligence. It has to be uh, reasonably quick and efficient to give to large groups of people. And so that's exactly what the Army wanted to come up with. And so this, then, is where we start to see the beginning of what we call the group aptitude measures. Okay? Tests that are measuring something that has to do with intellectual ability. Tests that can be given to large numbers of people uh, in a single setting uh, that aren't going to take too long, uh, that are reasonably efficient in getting information from people. Uh, but also, the information that you're getting is useful. Uh, obviously, what we get here, we're not going to think, is anywhere near as detailed or as good as the information that we're going to get from a test like this. But still, even if this is a much rougher sort of assessment, it's still useful. Okay? That's what the Army is interested in. Give me something that's useful. Give me something that tells me this guy can read, or if he can read, he can read at, at least a fifth grade level, or you know, can, is this guy going to understand me when I give an order, or do I have to do something else for this guy to understand? You know, give me a rough idea. That's what the Army Alpha and Beta were all about. These were group-administered uh, tests of aptitude. Okay? Um, the Alpha Here's an example of it. I know you can't see it very well, uh, but it's a multiple choice test, basically. basically okay? Ask the question, and then you've got different selections, and you mark one of the selections. Um, that's for people who are literate. The beta uh, was for illiterate guys, okay? somebody who couldn't read. Um, and interestingly enough, a lot of the kinds of test items that you have on the beta here, uh, the one that's for illiterate folks, are similar to the kinds of things that Weschler is going to be including on his performance part of his test. Uh, pattern recognition, fill in the blanks, uh, you know, things that don't necessarily require language, but still you have to have some kind of understanding of meaning and, and of logical flow and that, that sort of thing. Okay. Okay. One of the really, really important things about this step or this stage is it is out of these origins that all of the group aptitude tests that you guys have to take uh, are going to come out of. So uh, the GREs, if you go to graduate school, uh, the ACT, the SAT, you know, the uh, GMATs, which is for, G for medical school, the MCATs for law school, all of those group aptitude sorts of tests that so much can be riding on, their origins can be traced back to this. Okay? Now, obviously, over the decades, 
the kinds of group aptitude measures that we have today are much more sophisticated than what we had here. Uh, over the decades, tests have been updated. They've gotten much more um, sophisticated uh, in what they can measure and how they can measure it. And there's been all kinds of reliability you know, assessments of them. And, and so uh, when you're taking an ACT, uh, it is very, very moved from the original Army Alpha or Beta. Uh, but still, the basic idea is still there. Uh, and that is, this is a test that we can give to a large group of people. Um, we can score it reasonably efficiently. Uh, it doesn't take too long. You know, now they're up to a couple hours, I think, with how long these tests can take. Uh, but from that, we're not expecting to get a really, really detailed assessment of intelligence like what we get here with an individualized test. But we are expecting to get some important information that can be used by institutions and agencies as they're trying to make decisions about personnel. And that's really what all of these tests come down to. That's what the Army was trying to do. Uh, they needed a quick and dirty assessment that would help them make decisions about personnel. Uh, and that's what institutions are trying to do. Um, you know, academic institutions one being one of the biggest consumers of, of these sorts of tests. They're trying to make decisions about who they want to allow into their school, who, they, who do they want to admit. Uh, and the score on that test, even though it's not a perfect assessment of intelligence, um, it still does tell them something uh, about the likelihood of somebody being able to come into their school and being able to be successful in their school. Remember one of the important things that the Binet test, one of the important qualities uh, that this very, very early test of intelligence had, and that is that predictive quality. You can give somebody the test today, look at their number, and that gives you an idea of how likely they are to be successful later in your institution. That same principle is still applying, and that is probably one of the most important principles that's applying when it comes to all of the standardized uh, aptitude tests that flow from this origin here with the Army Alpha and Beta. Uh, the the um, ACTs, the SATs, all those sorts of things. One of the big reasons why everybody bitches and moans and complains about them, but everybody just keeps right on using them despite all of that complaining is because they continue to have this very, very important quality, which is predictive ability, right? You give somebody that test today, you look at that score on the ACT or the SAT, and that gives school administrators a pretty good idea of how likely it is that person's going to be successful in their institution. And the real world is what it is, man. Uh, schools are judged by graduation rates uh, and all that kind of stuff. And to keep their graduation rates up, they want to make sure that the people that they take in are ones that are likely to graduate in four years, five years, or whatever. If they're taking in huge numbers of people that the scores on the tests are indicating they're probably not likely to graduate, that ain't going to be good for their institution. Uh, and so these things still have a very practical use, despite the fact that they tend to be whipping boys for everybody that likes to complain about stuff. Um, but as long as they have that predictive ability, um, they're going to have some usefulness uh, in academic settings. So that's life. So there you go. There's the aptitude measures, the beginning of them, the group aptitude measures. Ah, oh, oh, well, and here we go. <laughs> okay, uh, yeah, so here's college admission tests, just like I was talking about, right? Uh, designed to test overall competence uh, in a specific domain and predict academic success. That's what they're all about. Um, these tests aren't perfect measures of intelligence, but they still do correlate pretty highly with IQ tests. Uh, so that's another quality that they have, uh, is they're not, uh, they're not, in a strict sense, an IQ test, um, but they do correlate quite highly with it. Those who score higher on an IQ test tend to be ones that do better on things like the ACT and the SAT. Okay? And all of those coaching courses that they advertise uh, that are gonna help you score higher on the SAT or the ACT or the GREs, um, they don't have no effect, uh, but their effects tend to be rather small. So they're probably not gonna hurt you any, um, but you can't really expect them to take a score that would otherwise be really low and make it really high, that's not going to happen. Uh, what they're more likely to do is uh, if without taking those coaching tests, you were going to score, you know, right about there, <laughs> uh, then if you do it, you're probably going to score maybe like that, okay? Uh, so it may boost things a little bit, uh, but it doesn't tend to take, um, uh, doesn't tend to have dramatic effects, okay? Okay, let's 
change gears just a little bit, okay? Um, because what we've been talking about so far is testing intelligence. Uh, and where did the idea of testing for intelligence come from? And how is it used? Uh, so all the guys that we've been talking about, Terman and Benet and Weschler, these guys are, in a sense, they're practitioners. They're out there in the real world trying to do something that has some kind of real world practical value. Okay? They're trying to develop a test that agencies, academic institutions, the army and other folks can actually use uh, in their operation. Uh, so they're doing something practical, which is odd for academics, because typically we try not to do anything practical. We just try to sit around and think about stuff. Okay, so that's where we're going now, though. Now we're talking about theoreticians, guys that deal with theory, uh, folks that aren't really interested in going out and trying to create a test to measure something that we might call intelligence. Instead, we're going to talk about folks that are just sitting around, ask, scratching their heads, asking the question, what is intelligence? I mean, what is it really? What are we talking about when we talk about intelligence? So these are the ivory tower guys uh, that are sitting around arguing with each other, uh, philo philosophical types, uh, only most of them are psychologists, uh, and they're trying to decide what is intelligence? How do we define it? What do we really mean by it? What's included in the concept or the idea of intelligence? And that's the history of this. Okay, now we're looking at the history of trying to understand what intelligence is from a theoretical standpoint. Okay, where does this start? This starts with a fellow named Spearman, uh, and it's starting around the same time as Galton, when I started with him, which is mid-1800s or so. Okay? Uh, and so at the same time that Galton was trying to test intelligence, you had other people like Spearman who were trying to define intelligence. Okay? So what did he say? He, he starts this whole thing. What does he say intelligence is? He says intelligence is this general ability to be able to function effectively in your environment. He calls it G, little g. Intelligence is a general thing. And you ha either have a lot of it or you don't have much of it. And if you have a lot of it, then you're going to be intelligent in all kinds of ways. Uh, or at least we can say you're going to have the potential to be intelligent in all kinds of ways. Okay? Now, over time, because you're interested in math or you're interested in history, you take your general intelligence ability, you take your general ability to reason and think uh, and function effectively, and, and you apply it to history because that's what you love. So you, be, you get really smart in history. But you could have been really smart in a lot of other things because you had a lot of this general intellectual ability, this little g. So little g is a general thing, okay? Uh, and little g can give rise to specific abilities, okay? But those specific abilities are dependent upon how you dedicate your g, right? Okay, and I, I see some of you nodding out there saying, yeah, okay, that makes sense, right? Um, okay, and this accounts for the intellectual differences, right? Uh, in individuals. So the reason why one person is smart and somebody isn't so smart is how much G they got endowed with. Okay. All right, then we have others who talk about multiple abilities. They come along later. And when they say multiple abilities, what they mean is there isn't a single type of intelligence that you can then apply to different areas to develop your specific abilities. Instead, there are only separate individual types of intelligence. So the intelligence for mathematics is a different kind of intelligence than the intelligence for history. And the intelligence for history is a separate, independent type of intelligence from social intelligence, or different, separate from linguistic intelligence. So in this view, intelligence isn't a single thing. It's a set of separate, independent things. And you may be born with a lot of verbal intelligence and very little social intelligence. Okay. And that's why you're really good with language and stuff like that, uh, but you're really not good at parties, okay? Uh, because there are different, you know, different individual independent forms of intelligence, uh, and people vary in how much of these things they have. Right? So that was Thurston and Guilford's idea. Right? Totally different from the little g idea. Now we have... Uh, something different, a fellow named Cattell. What, what often happens uh, when you have these two opposing views, you've got the general view and then the multiple abilities view, is somebody comes along and tries to sort of put them together, right? 
uh, tries to take the best of both worlds and, and bring them together into one theory. And that's what you can think of Cattell as doing here. Um, he's trying to take the general ability, general factor, little g, combine it with multiple abilities, uh, and have the best of both worlds in one theory. And so he comes up with his theory, which argues that there's actually two kinds of g. Right? And I think I have a slide on this. Yeah, OK. So here's Cattell. And he argues that um, Spearman was right to a certain extent. There is this g. But the other guys, Guilford and Thurston, were right in that there also are these separate abilities. Okay? But he's going to explain both of these by looking at two different types of G, or arguing about, or, or arguing that there are two different types of G. Right? There is what he referred to as um, fluid intelligence, okay, or fluid G, G fluid, uh, and there's crystallized intelligence, or G crystallized. All right. All right. So what is fluid intelligence? Fluid intelligence is your general ability to learn. Okay. Uh, that's your ability simply to be able to understand signals, understand information, process that information, make sense out of it, use that information to adaptively function in your world. Your ability to learn stuff, that's fluid intelligence. Okay? Crystallized intelligence, then, is your storehouse of knowledge that you build up in particular areas by using your fluid intelligence. Okay? So what I do now with my fluid intelligence, my ability to learn, is I apply it a lot to history, and I build up a lot of crystallized intelligence or a lot of knowledge about history. Okay? Uh, and at the same time that I'm doing that, I may also take my fluid intelligence and I may apply it to mathematics. Uh, and so I start to build up a big storehouse of knowledge in mathematics. Uh, that's my crystallized intelligence. That's what I know uh, in specific areas. Uh, and so people can vary in both of these things. You know, if I have a lot of fluid intelligence, I can build up more quickly and more efficiently a, a number of storehouses in different specific areas of intelligence. Right? If my fluid intelligence isn't so great, then it's harder for me to do that. Okay? But, so this is learning, and this is what you've learned in specific areas. Okay? Your storehouse of knowledge in certain areas. Okay. One of the important things that distinguishes fluid from crystallized intelligence uh, is what's referred to as their developmental course. All right? um, fluid intelligence, when you're first born, starts off very, very small. So you think of a little tiny infant, a newborn infant, and they can't learn much. Uh, their ability to learn is really limited. So it does you absolutely no good. Uh, to sit your little newborn infant, sit them down, lay them down, you know, in, in their cradle or whatever, and try to start teaching them differential equations, you know, calculus. Not going to work. Uh, they simply don't have the capacity to be able to understand, process, understand, and use that stuff. So their fluid intelligence is really, really limited when they start. But as kids get older, their fluid intelligence gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, and so we think, Cattell argued, Fluid intelligence probably peaks right about at the age that you guys are at, you know, around 20, 25, or something like that, young adulthood. That's when you're at your peak, uh, they argue, in terms of being able to learn stuff. Okay? Then, after that, it sort of plateaus, and then it steadily kind of does this as you get older and older, okay? where you can still learn stuff, but it takes more effort and more energy. Okay? So that's how fluid intelligence works. It does this, da, 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 da. like that, over the course of someone's lifetime. Crystallized intelligence, though, he argued, that is something that can continually build up more and more over time. So you can continue to add more knowledge in your various storehouses as you get older and older. So crystallized intelligence you know, does this, potentially. It just keeps getting bigger, bigger, and bigger. So, you know, if I'm a historian, uh, even when I'm 80-some years old, I can still be learning more about the Civil War or World War II or whatever. Uh, it, you know, it may take longer for me to do it when I'm 80 years old, but still, I can learn more and more. Uh, and so crystallized intelligence continues to build and to build, uh, even on into old age, assuming that the brain, you know, remains healthy. Okay? Uh, and so that's why, according to Cattell, Grandpa 
may be slow, but he's incredibly wise, okay? Uh, he's, you know, takes him longer to get things going, uh, but he has all this knowledge, all this experience in so many areas that he's able to access. Okay, that's where we'll stop. Next time, uh, we'll pick up and we'll start with the modern theories of intelligence. Uh, with Garner and Sternberg, uh, and we're back to the multiple abilities, but uh, I'll pick that up in class next time, though. For now, that's good enough. So, see you later, gang. <laughs>